Welcome to the Savvy Dentist Podcast with Dr. Jesse Green, the show where great dentistry meets great business. Listen in each week as we bring you an inspiring person who will share their story, ideas, and business techniques to help you create a practice and a life you love. And now introducing your host, Dr. Jesse Green. Welcome back to the Savvy Dentist Podcast, a show where great dentistry does indeed meet great business. And we are going to be having a conversation today around peak performance and the power of connection. My guest is a coach and trainer who works in that field and has worked with really incredible brands such as Holden, CGU, Emirates, and the National Australia Bank. And interestingly, he's also consulted several sporting teams, two of my faves actually, the Collingwood Footy Club and Cricket Australia. And Collingwood's going along all right, so Rick, we'll have to talk about that. Rick Rushton is our guest and is also the author of a wonderful book called The Power of Connection and it's my view that connection is what gives meaning and purpose to our lives. So we're going to be having a conversation about all of those things. Now before we do get to the meat and potatoes of our conversation, I want to encourage everyone to head across to your favorite app store and download the Savvy Dentist app. There's heaps of free resources there, tools, training and bits and pieces and of course join us in the Facebook group as well. You can do all that through your phone of course or whatever device takes your fancy but the Savvy Dentist app and the Facebook group is where we can continue the conversation but in terms of getting today's conversation kicked off, Rick Rushton, thank you so much for taking the time to come and hang with us. How are you my friend? I'm very well, buddy. Thank you for the opportunity. Can't think of anything better than spending quality time with quality people in search of more quality. So thank you. Oh, mate. Look, I've been looking forward to this conversation because I've been aware of your work now for quite some time and you've got your book out called The Power of Connection, which really speaks to my heart. And I wanted to just start our conversation by reflecting on the importance of a book like that in the digital world. And interestingly enough, we went out for a Christmas party the other night for our work and I was looking at the table next door and there was a a couple there having a romantic dinner for two with their mobile phones. And I'm wondering, why do you think connection is so important these days? Well, I think it's far more important in this high-tech, high-touch world that what we know with the phone is it can connect you with someone who's on the other side of the planet. It, It can disconnect you from someone who's sitting opposite you at a romantic dinner table where I, like you, travel a lot, go to a lot of restaurants, and I see a lot of interactions where you can see the husband getting really involved in what is the chef's special? How should I have the steak ordered? Yet his wife sitting opposite or his partner sitting opposite is going, any moment now, he's going to recognize the effort I've put in to getting my hair just right for tonight. And if you could just make one compliment to me, that would just open up so much more of a deeper relationship. And I, I sort of watch that and I look at that and I think there is the challenge that we are right now. We're more connected. We're more high tech than ever before, Jesse, but we're far more disconnected in the most simplistic of things. So, you know, I think it's really a nature of who we are in 28, you now as we've now gone into 2019 and who we will be to become by the end of this year with the fact that there's $7.6 billion being invested in the prop tech space, in the property market space, which I came from, real estate. And so what we know there is everyone's looking for the new high-tech sort of gadget in 2019 instead of the new high-touch way of reconnecting with people. And I don't think it's anything we have to reinvent. It's just getting back in touch with what we already knew, which is when we were taught from a young age to connect with others. So it's a really interesting point because dentistry is face to face. I know now you use the word belly to belly. It's probably not quite the extreme that we go to in, <laughs> in dentistry, but it's a very personal interaction. You know, you are literally hands in someone's mouth. You've got a lot of people who are anxious. You've got a lot of people who are feeling a certain sense of trepidation. And my take on that is that we seem to, for some people, have moved into a transactional world where you get what you pay for. We exchange and then we disappear. And it's my observation that the people who build really successful businesses of any kind, but particularly in dentistry, is that that sense of connection is really the glue that holds it together. So I wanted to ask you, and I know this is going to sound obvious, but I think it's worth just exploring nonetheless, is how do you actually build connection? How do you do it with a specific intent and how do you do it in a way that's not cheesy and fake, but but deliberate nonetheless? Well, I think the first thing we do is we build rapport. It's rapport that opens more doors. So you and I can connect very easily because we're very similar. We value the same things. We want to go into a relationship to see what we can bring to it and give to it, not what we can get from it. And so I think 
every dentist patient that I've ever met, and I've been one of them, and I'm afraid of actually having this discussion with you, other than the fact that, thank God it's audio, because I'm really conscious that you're looking at maybe the whitening of my teeth, I don't know. My view is, is that most dentist patients are very much like uh, every interaction that everyone listening to this podcast would have, which is, if they're similar to you, you go and connect with them, no problems at all. How do you connect with someone who's 180 degree from you? Because what I know, Jess, is that there are no successful hermits. We need other people to find success, no matter what that is. You could be the most technically gifted dentist of all time, but if there's no one sitting in your chair, it doesn't really matter what your expertise is like. You don't have the ability to attract someone to your value proposition. So my view has always been that I will get along with like-minded people. Put me in a room of 100 people, I'll find the 10 or 20 who are just like me. But how do I connect with the 80 that aren't like me? Well, that means I have to shift my thinking from stop broadcasting on Rick Rushton's channel and tune into Dr. Jesse Green's frequency, whatever that may be. So tune in before you broadcast. And that allows you then to go, oh, Jesse's more of a, uh, what I would call a blue type personality, very process driven, very considerate. So might want to have the formula laid out, might want me to slow down a little bit. And I'm exaggerating for the, the point of the podcast, but even just simply changing the tonality and the pace of your voice will help you connect with other people who aren't like you. So the first thing I do when I meet someone is I tune into who they are from a personality trait, from from a speech pattern trait, or more importantly, just from a personality trait, how I see them approach me with what sort of energy they've got. If someone's coming into your dentistry office and they're very timid and very reserved, they're either incredibly scared about the root canal that's about to happen, or they're just very much fearful of pain, or they're just uncertain because this is putting them outside of their comfort zone. We as human beings are hardwired to avoid anything that's going to hurt us. So going to the dentist is not right up there with most people's ideal day. So what we've got to be able to work out is let's connect with them. Let's find out who they are. Let's find out what they're thinking and let's broadcast accordingly. Now, we probably had a few minutes to do that a decade ago. We've got a few seconds to do it now. So it's the ability to tune in first, Jesse, and then broadcast on the frequency of the other person is one of the major keys. Yeah, I think that's a really, really important thing. So I guess what you're saying and to paraphrase is to ask questions, to really listen very carefully to the words perhaps to even what's not being said, the subtext, to observe, you know, using all your senses, your eyesight and so on, and then to basically assimilate that information to, as you say, tune into someone and then hopefully, you know, be able to adjust your style of communication to meet theirs. So that's, that's a, I think, a really important process to go through and say, listeners, please, if you've just tuned in, uh, having a conversation about building connection with specific intent in an authentic manner, I'd really encourage you just to rewind 15, 20 seconds, a minute ago, and just listen to that again. And Rick, if connection is the glue that holds us together and we now have a process for establishing connection, how do we maintain connection? Is it more of the same or do we have to take that to that relationship, that rapport to a deeper level? Well, I don't think it's anything we can do as the person wanting to take it to the next level. It really has to be in rapport with the person sort of opposite. We see it so often, don't we, where, you know, friends change relationships, maybe go to their second or third marriage. They seem to bring the the, the poor dance moves to a new dance and expect that it's going to actually come up with something different. But what we know is, is that at some stage, the reality has to be maybe they as individuals have to shift the way they expect to form a connection and build a relationship. See, my wife and I have been together for 35 years this year, Jesse. So the reality is, is that I've got to be better in 2019 than I was in 2018 with our ability to interact. Because if I'm bringing the same lines, the same dance moves, if you will, to a different beat, I'm going to be in a little bit of trouble. So it's all about not so much trying to get the other person to form the deeper connection with us, but for us to shift our thinking around it our approach to it and so therefore what would happen is and by the way if you saw my wife you know I told her if you know she leaves me I'm going with her but um, (laughs) you know I I knew I was going to do well in sales when I was able to convince her to sort of stick with me but if if you if she was here now and and part of this interview she would say that she's heard all the one-liners from Rick over the journey so she's looking for some new way that I can communicate to her that she is the most important person in my life that without her being my biggest cheerleader and raving fan 
I don't get the ability to do what I want to do in a professional sense. So it's all about not so much how we want the other person to upscale their relationship with us. It's our ability, Jesse, our ability to shift our thinking around how can I solidify, if you will, consolidate this relationship in a more powerful way. Uh, Rick, hallelujah, brother. I think that's absolute gold because it's interesting as you're reflecting on your relationship with your wife, I was reflecting on my relationship with my wife and I totally think that I'm punching above my weight to, uh, <laughs> to, to use that great Australian expression. And like your wife, my wife allows me to do the things that I need to do professionally. So you're right, 2019 is the year showing up better than 2018. And for me, that requires... Not the same old dance moves, as you say. You know, the chicken dance gets a little bit wears thin after a while. So uh, I, have to yeah. sh- I have to sharpen up my own moves as well. Well, you know, I mean, the macaroni was great till Cy came along. He just wrecked it for everybody. And I'm still of that generation of the bus stop, mate. So I can really go way, way, way back if we really wanted to. Oh, mate, that's all right. We'll have to bust out a few moves later. There we go. Mate, you spoke about connection. And I, in my research for our interview, I, of course, had a look at your website. And there was an interesting comment on your website or an instant, interesting turn of phrase that I really wanted to explore with you and because we're talking about the book the power of connection and the tagline is how to become a master communicator in your workplace your headspace and at your place and i'd love to talk about your headspace because that's that's a really interesting concept and it's not a concept that i think really gets enough attention i think what goes on beyond between our ears i should say is incredibly important if we want to have things happen externally we've got to look at the internal as we've already discussed so I wanted to ask you about becoming a master communicator in your own headspace. Could you walk us through that? Well, I think you're in Canberra, I'm in Melbourne. I think my paper is the Herald Sun, your paper is the Canberra Times. Fill in the blank for wherever you're listening to this podcast around the globe. Here's what I know about that local paper. If you went and got a copy of that today, if you went straight to the death notices there, you'd find two things. Number one, everyone seems to die in alphabetical order. Have you noticed that, Jesse? So it'd be... It'd be you're lucky you're an R, mate. Yeah, that's exactly right. So it'd be a good time to change your name to Ziggy Sikowski, I think. But the second thing is, to, and in all seriousness, here's the real lesson here. Every person listed there would gladly change places with you to have one day of whatever you think is a challenge in 2019 because they would certainly swap places with you very quickly. So the first thing we have to do, if you wake up and your feet hit terra firma, and you can look out at a cloudy grey Melbourne morning or a cloudy grey Canberra morning. As depressing as that might be, I tell you what, there's a billion people on the planet they can't even see. So they would gladly change places with you. So it changes with your thinking straight away. If you just wake up and go, I'm drawing breath, I'm alive, what a great day. Any day above ground is a great day. Now, I go looking for great things and I'm thinking about, I'm hardwiring myself to look for gratitude, to look for opportunities, to look for thankfulness, to look for things that will add value. No different than everyone listening to this podcast right now, the car that you are driving right now. Now, when you were researching that car to buy it, the make, the model, the colour, whether you bought it off the lot brand new or whether you bought it secondhand, I guarantee you the minute you started researching that vehicle, you started seeing that car on all the freeways and all the roads in your town. Why? Because your brain's looking for reinforcement of a decision you've made, which is I want to buy a new car. I just want to upgrade my life in 2019. Now that I have that thought, it changes my self-talk. So instead of me sort of saying to myself, now, how am I going to get better this year? How am I going to be fitter, faster, stronger, in better relationships and all those sorts of things? My brain is wired to say, why do I want that? If I don't know why I want it, the how part doesn't really, really matter. I mean, you know, we all know what to do, to be brutally candid. Anyone who's got the technological savvy to get onto this podcast already knows what it's going to take to have a great life in 2019. It's not knowing what to do. It's actually doing what you know. So to do what you know, you have to be programmed first. And it all starts with that. how we think determines how we feel. How we feel determines how we act. How we act starts with our own self-talk initially. Am I good enough now? Am I strong enough now? Who am I to run a podcast? I think the mortality rate on podcasts are pretty poor, a bit like marriages technically. Yeah, seven episodes is apparently the, the, the death knell. You say if you pass seven, you're okay. There you go. So, you know, and you're almost 150 episodes in, so kudos to you. But all I'm trying to sort of say there is how we think determines how we feel, how we feel determines how we act. And it all starts with our little voice inside our heads. Now, some of your listeners are thinking, what's the voice that Rick's talking about? That's the voice I'm talking about. You don't say it out loud. 
but you hear yourself talk to yourself more often than anything else you hear every single day that you're awake. So my view would be get the self-talk right. So it starts in our headspace. That reflects then into our workplace, but more importantly, in our home space where we go home at the end of the day, that's where we want it to be as great as we can make it because here's what I know in that particular respect. As I get asked all the time in the real estate space, Jesse, have you got any smart lines for the shifting market? I go, it's a bit like saying, have you got something romantic I can say to my wife? The reality is the words are one part, but who you are and how you deliver them is everything and so what i know about that is is that that's why the headspace is such an important part of it so we all want to connect there's no doubt about that the best connection you can form straight away though is a better connection to you that's probably my message for 2019 yeah and again i think that's an incredibly important message too rick and because just again some observations of mine throughout the year you know dealing with you know obviously some clients but more broadly than clients talking with kids at school and all the you know, different sorts of people you interact with it's really interesting that self-talk can be hijacked from a relatively young age and it's really incredibly damaging to people over the long term you hear that negative self-talk so there'll be someone driving along in the car right now rick who'll be saying yeah that's fine rick but when i look in the mirror i don't necessarily like the person i see for whatever whatever reason you've got purple spots in your face big nose or whatever so how do you actually go through that process of learning to speak a little more kindly to yourself? And again, I know that it sounds very simple, but not always easy to break that habit. Well, everyone listening knows that they perform better in their roles as a professional or in their roles on the home front when they feel better about themselves. So we can wait for outside forces to give that to us or we can give it to ourselves. Now, you're absolutely spot on. Most of our beliefs are formed from a very early age. We're born a blank canvas. But who we support in the football club, who we vote for, right or left side of politics, what we believe globally, what we actually believe maybe spiritually is really embedded into us by well-meaning parents, well-meaning teachers, well-meaning family, friends and and things of that nature. My father was a, a classic very hard-working Australian bloke who drove a hold and that was it. His whole belief about life was was that you show up, you do your best, at some stage you're going to get paid for it and that's really the extent of his life. He didn't travel outside of the country till he was well into his 50s. So when I think about that modelling, Jesse, when I think about that sort of example for me growing up, what I also know is he was very good at saying things like this to me, hey, mate, go for it, you know, shoot for the stars, but don't forget where you came from. Go, go, go high for the moon, but don't forget you're a boy from Baronia, so keep your foot firmly placed in this postcode. So he was well-meaning, but at some stage you've got to realise that's not going to be self-serving. So then I flip it to the other side. My mother-in-law is, when I first met her back in 1983, she was like, could not have been a bigger, like the way she was describing me, you'd think I was six foot tall. Now, most of your listeners don't get to see the fact that I'm kind of a little bit height challenged. You know, I'm probably about five, seven on a good day. But my view is there, somewhere between those two sort of descriptions about me is probably the reality. Now, here's what I decided. I'm going to actually give myself a fair understanding about who I am under positive self-esteem, i.e. when someone says, hey, great interview, Rick, I'm not going to say, oh, I don't know, I could have been probably a little bit more concise or, oh, thank you, I'll take that on board. They're both ends of the spectrum. But what I say is, thank you, I appreciate the feedback. In your opinion, though, how could that have been a little bit better? Because I'm looking to get a little bit better. So my whole view is I'm good enough right now to do what I need to do, but how can I be a little bit better so that by the end of 2019 I've got 1% better? Because all I'm looking to do is get a little bit better. So it starts with my ability to ask better questions of myself to build up that self-esteem. So if I don't think I'm tall enough, strong enough, young enough, old enough, experienced enough, whatever it may be, a better question to ask is, is what can I, what gifts do I bring to the table right now? How, how am I showing up? And is there, what can I control with those things? So my DNA is my DNA. Don't get to control that to a degree, but I do get to control what I do with the gifts I've got. So part of that is accepting who I am and looking for the improvements along the way and understanding I'm never going to be George Clooney. I'm never going to be a six foot tall ruckman or maybe six foot six in this day and age. I'm never going to be those things, Jesse. So what's the best way I can play right now in the gifts I've been given and you know, maybe repackage them a little bit, maybe forget about my parents' packaging, maybe forget about my teacher's packaging. I was always told I spoke too much at school. Now I get paid to speak. So you, you kind of got to go, that was probably important 
for a teacher who is trying to get 28 other pupils, Jesse, to sort of follow a set routine. But I never want to follow a set routine. One plus one equals two. Well, what does that mean? Well, now that I've got that, what else can I do with it? I'm a creative guy. I look for other things. So I can't let my prep teacher's mindset affect my delivery for the balance of my life they've got you for about seven years haven't they school teachers or maybe 14 or depending on what you do with your life after that so yeah my view is you package yourself the way you want to repack if you were brand if hollywood made your life into a movie right now would you even go and see it and the answer is no i wouldn't well it's time to rewrite the script it's 2019 we could write the outcome any way we want we can have the life we want not what our parents thought we should have had not what our teachers expected us to have what we want to have in this game of life. So repackage it ourselves is probably the very long window. It was more like a seminar there, wasn't it, than, a, than an answer, but hopefully it sort of ticked the box. Well, no, it ticks the box in a very big way, mate, and what I really take away from that is you get to write the script. So write the mm. script you enjoy, and it doesn't have to be a script that's imposed upon you. So maybe it's time to get out the pen and paper and start thinking about how I want my life to be and start putting some constructive thought into that and then getting that self-talk right and making some traction in that pro- in that process. Rick, just to change gear for a second, I mentioned in the intro you've had the opportunity to work with some incredible teams. Collingwood Footy Club, love the Magpies. Sorry for all the Carlton, Carlton supporters listening. I think my listenership just dropped away a little bit as I said that. <laughs> But equally, the Australian cricket team who you know have been playing for the last few weeks or months and I'm curious to understand a little bit about culture. It's no secret that over the last little while, the Australian cricket team has had some culture challenges with the episode in South Africa and then having to rebuild culture. So I wanted to ask you about culture in teams and moving forward together as a unit. We've spoken about the individual, but I want to talk about moving together, moving forward together. Could you just give us your thoughts around that? Yeah, whether it be a high-performance team or whether it be a dental practice or whether it be any organisation, even a family, Jesse, you've got to be very clear on what we value as a group. So you and I would be similar. I'm fairly certain about that. So I'm pretty confident that we'd have similar values. But it takes everyone to make a symphony orchestra. We need the banging of the drums and the clashing of the cymbals, but we need the subtleties of the flute. So in my business practice, that was my business manager. He wanted to be tucked away, left away in the corner to do her thing, which is I was good at making money no good at keeping it she was very good at sort of making sure i didn't donate to the australian tax office not into not paying taxes just don't want to pay more than i should she was amazingly good at that now if i brought her up in front of the rest of the team and said hey just want to make a mention a special mention of die this month her job this last month has been outstanding she's she would start self-sabotaging because that's just not who she is. She hated that. She'll make sure she performs poorly next month so that Rick doesn't do that to her again. So part of a a really high-performing team is to understand that everyone's got a role to play. They've got to know their role. They've got to do their role, but they've got to do it under some clear, defined values. Values, it's very, and without using a Collingwood pun, for those who don't follow AFL, Collingwood's colours are black and white. It's very black and white. If you're a boot stutter walking into Collingwood or the number one player on the list getting paid over a million dollars a year, you know what we value there. And if you are held accountable to those values from a performance scenario, you're probably going to make sure you're ticking those boxes. But when there's a review of Collingwood, it's not how did you go last month, it's how did you improve your role towards our values and then you're rewarded by that. So instead of saying, if you ticked off an economic goal, we'll reward you. It's more to the point of how have you added to our absolute value of care? How did you show care this last month? Who, who did you give care to? And more importantly, were you given some care from someone else that we can acknowledge as someone who's living our value? So you've got to be very clear about what you value. So in our real estate business that I built up from scratch and ended up selling a couple of years ago to to do this thing, you know, the author thing and the speaking thing, Jesse. I I said if you're gonna come work with us, you're gonna believe in God. That was pretty high, that was pretty heavy. But God was an acronym that stood for growth, opportunity and discipline. So if you come and work for us, you're going to help us grow. We'll grow you, but you've got to grow us too. So we're going to give you that opportunity, but you have to help us do that. The second thing is we'll create opportunities for you, but you've got to create opportunities for us to grow our business too. And the last thing is without discipline, neither of those first two things are going to work. So when someone overheard someone speaking to a client in a poor way, whether they were the most experienced person in the house or just started as a Saturday reception, they had the right to walk up and go, hey, Rick, when I heard you say that, what part of growth 
what are you doing there? What sort of opportunities are you creating for our company with that sort of language? So it's a, keeping everybody into account. Everyone listening to this particular podcast who's a business owner, you've got a culture. If you can define it, that's outstanding. But most people have a culture whether they know it or not. And sometimes I would walk past a bit of ordinary behaviour and let it go. What I've learned now being around elite peak performance organisations, Jesse, is the standard you walk past is the standard you accept and you say by default, that's the standard we can accept here. So if Jack sees Jill do that, Jack thinks, well, I can do that too. If Akmal sees that happen, he thinks, well, Shari did that, so I can do that too. So therefore, what happens is you build this culture of behaviour based on what they're seeing, not so much in what's being held accountable to them, but what's allowed to let fly. So what I know about a business like mine and a business like yours and a business like most of our listeners, it's a hard one in this day and age because you're going to have Generation X employees and they're going to have Generation Next coming through millennials, and they that they weren't even born onto the same planet, so they don't, you know, they're looking for totally different things in their working environment. But what what the one thing that values does, it keeps us all aligned. So be very clear on what your values are. And my view is is that as a leader, you'll have an understanding about what they are, but you need to get your team to arrive at that same port so that we can all tick off on this is what we're agreeing we value, and you make decisions around that. So you reward to them. You hold people accountable to them. And some people, you might need to free up their future and say, you just don't seem to want to live our values. And that's okay. There's got to be some goal out there that you can achieve in another working environment. We need to get you into another paddock. Let, let, let's help do that. It's typically a trip to the car park, two go, one come back. You know, it's got to be me. <laughs> it's, it's, it's my paddock to a degree, but it's our paddock too. And so business is all about P&L. And it's not so much the profit and loss that everyone expects. It's about people and leverage. P for people, L for leverage. Get the right people, you leverage your business. And I don't care who you are, what your industry is, you surround your team with generation X to generation next and all parts in between. And you get them all knowing their role, doing their role, playing their role, being held accountable to some great values. You're going to have a humming business in 2019 and beyond. And that's really one of the things I'm really passionate about. Yeah, look, there's a lot of wisdom there. And so for those people who have just joined us here, we're having a conversation about culture. We're having a talk about high-performing teams and you know, Rick's work dealing with Collingwood, uh, Cricket Australia and many others. We're talking about the importance of articulating culture, knowing your culture, because there is a culture whether you articulate it or not. And the key thing that I really picked out of that conversation, Rick, was, and the phrase that I use to, to paraphrase you, is you get what you tolerate, what you walk past is what you accept. And I think that's really important. So for the listener, I'd really encourage you to take those words to heart because it's not what you necessarily hold people to account to. It's not necessarily the, what you speak, what you do, and what is seen. It's what's let go. And I think that there's a couple of really salient points in there. And for some people, that means embracing a little bit of discomfort and having that conversation that might lead to a little bit of a lump in the throat or it might lead to sweaty palms. But... Rick, I guess my, my follow-up question for you around that is summoning the courage to then call that out and to say, Rick, that's not godlike, to use your acronym. Just for, on a practical sense, there, there'll be someone who's sitting in a car driving right now going, yeah, I, I've totally got to have a conversation. I've totally let some stuff go that I shouldn't have, and now I've got to have that conversation. In a practical sense, how does that work out? Yeah, so you've got to be very comfortable about being uncomfortable. I don't know who coined that phrase, but it's a great phrase. I love to try and give credit to the people where I learned this stuff from. But you've got to be very comfortable about being uncomfortable, Jesse, to the point where it's like, it gives me no joy to have this conversation with you, Jesse, but just let's just go through it. When I heard you say that, what part of our values are you honouring there? When you spoke down to that particular, I know she's a, a dental nurse, but she's an important person in our team. And but if I let that go, I'm, I'm, I'm saying it's quite okay to talk to our, our support team in a poor way. It's not the Marines, mate. You're not Lieutenant Colonel Nathan R. Jessup and you can talk down to the actual Marine any way you like. We're a collaborative team here. So just talk me through. So it's very uncomfortable to have that chat, but here's what's more uncomfortable, mate seeing your business go backwards because you can't drive it forward because you've got incredibly solid understandings about what your values are. They're up on the wall. That was Cricket Australia. Had the values up on the wall but weren't living it when it was really mattering. So values to me matter most. Our head coach at Collingwood, Nathan Buckley, has a great saying. He says, values matter most, not here in this room here, but out on an MCG at 2 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon when you're under the extreme heat. Because we could all know the values, but when we're put under the pump, we sometimes default back to some poor behaviour because we're just under pressure. So uh, what we know 
about great organisations are is that when the heat's on and the, it's absolutely get flying, that's when their values show up and it's that, that sort of thing. So for me, early on in my real estate business building career and we come up with God, I actually had a chat with someone who wasn't following. It was a, uh, he was my best producer, Jesse. So if he, if he leaves my company, he leaves a massive hole in our revenue stream. But what I had to say to him is I said, look, you know, I don't think this is a, a, a double conversation. It's just one conversation fairly simply. We've all agreed. We've all signed in. We're all buying in. You signed the hat. We, we passed the hat around and just said, here's what we value. Sign in. And if you sign in, you're in. And if you, if you, if you don't want it, that's fine too. Now, you signed in. You did. Long story short, I freed him, his future up and send him out the door. Now, that was a massive message because what that said to the rest of the team is if Rich prepared to do that with our best player, Nathan Buckley did that with a very, very, very solid player at Collingwood. He said, free agencies come early. You can tell us where you want to go. We'll free you up. No, I want to be the captain of this club. That's not going to happen based on not so much who you are. We think who you are inherently is a nice person, but your behaviours don't match that. So where do you want to go? He freed up that player. What that said to every other player on the list was, wow. If he could do that with him, he could do that with anybody. So maybe it's time we either bought in. There's no buy-in unless you understand why. And now what happens is, is that Collingwood goes from being a club where a few players try to get out to everyone's trying to get in. <laughs> you know, we retain so many players because the culture is so strong now that people and people will come to us for less money than what's being offered out there. In the, and that's the lesson for everyone listening here. Economics is one part of attracting new talent to your team. So what we know in Australia, 25 million people, but the talent pool is very shallow in most industries to try and create and get new recruits coming in. Most people want to go to the cafe where everyone's trying to get the coffee. No one wants to go to the cafe where there's empty booths. So how do you fill your particular organisation with a vibe, with an energy? It all starts around your values. If you can't define what they are, you won't be able to sort of attract new talent. Here's the other thing, though. You may need to have a tough conversation. And you know what? The tougher conversation is going to be with your bank or going to be with a real estate agent who has to come and see your house because your business has gone bust because you tolerated some very ordinary behaviour that affected your bottom line in your business. And it is about P&L. If you can't attract the right people, you can't leverage your business and you're going to be in a strong position to sort of talk to debt collectors, I think, rather than talk to the new generation that wants to come in and join your team. Mate, while we're talking about God, I'm just going to say amen to that because (laughs) there's a lot of really salient lessons in there as well. And the, the type of language that we use for regular listeners will be the performance culture matrix. You might have a high performer who's not a culture fit. And that's the conversation that I think you're talking about there. Rick is having that courage to call out that poor behavior, that culture misfit, even though you might be benching or freeing up the future. I call it liberating, but at the same time, same message is to to bench someone, put them out to pasture if you need to, because if there is a culture of misfit there, that is a bigger problem. And what I really love about that is if you don't deal with it now, it will totally come back and bite you on the backside later. And that will be a bigger problem than the one you're dealing with now. So for the business owners listening to this, I'd really encourage you to take stock, to think about what you're accepting and to have that conversation be comfortable being uncomfortable so Rick really really important so let's let's talk briefly about Cricket Australia (laughs) yep because I don't want to rain on them I love cricket in my quiet moments I dream of being an opening batsman even though I average about 0.5 I guess the the thing that comes up with Cricket Australia is there's such a clear example of where culture got way out of hand and there is, you've seen what happens when you don't deal with it. You know, we spoke a moment ago about having the courageous conversation and dealing with it. And that's an example of what happens when it's not dealt with. You know, the, the, it imploded. I mean, since that event in South Africa, the ball tampering event, where people have, you know, let the team down, let themselves down, it's a rebuilding process. So I wanted to ask you, for someone who might be going through a rebuilding process, what's the first step? Well, the first step is to, we have to do it from the top down. So a lot of culture is driven from the bottom up in many respects. You know, the the last person on the list, the last person out the door sets the culture for the next day and about how they leave the office potentially. But if you saw anything at Cricket Australia, and I've been involved now in two fairly pivotal moments in CA's history. The first was in 2011. I was on tour with the cricket team that we were in Sri Lanka in the subcontinent. It was the first sort of tour 
where as as Tim Nielsen, who was the coach at the time, the Argus report came out, there was a lot going on there with that, including some of the communication styles had to be sort of, you know, maybe shifted and changed. And then obviously most recently with what we saw happen nine months ago in, in South Africa, at both times there was a, a structural change in Cricket Australia's leadership and you just saw this this past month. So what I'm thinking you're going to see happen in any organisation where they're trying to drive that and do that, Jesse, there has to be a change of thinking or leadership at the very top. And then that filters back down now. So the new CEO of Cricket Australia is an amazing guy. I know this only personally because my son works in Cricket Australia at the moment, was a fairly talented cricketer from a young age, has you know, been a, a touring professional over in the UK and has played at a high level here in Australia for a long time. But one of the things that's interesting to note there, and this gives you an example, about how leadership changes some sometimes most things but when his appointment happened he got about 1100 congratulatory emails Jesse his inbox was flooded with oh well done congratulations he got one handwritten thank you note which came from my son my son received a phone call from the new CEO of Cricket Australia inside the building that they work in and said, hey, Chris, this is uh, Kevin here, just got your note. I just want to say I've had 1,100 emails and one handwritten thank you note. I want to meet you, I want to say thank you to you and see how best I can help you with your career at Cricket Australia. Before Chris could even get that message off his phone, he gets a tap on the shoulder from the new CEO. He explains what the message was about. Chris says, I'd love to just grab a coffee with you and see how best I, because my ultimate goal is to be a a high-ranking official in a elite sports program and I think you could show me a lot and learn a lot over an hour of coffee goes let's go right now for a coffee what that had now you fast forward that a few months now and so my son is now the executive assistant to the CEO of Cricket Australia because of a handwritten note but it says we're going to we're going to reward Jesse the, and I say that story to impress you about Rick Sun's a great guy I, I'm so the, the message there is is that here's a leader who's going to reward behavior he wants so what gets rewarded gets done what gets rewarded gets measured what gets re- rewarded is the pedestal now that everyone says maybe we've got to stop just flicking emails to people and go hey jesse i noticed what you did there with that great job you're helping us get better great job that sort of that's so i've walked through the doors of jolly mont and it's been like a funeral and i've walked through the doors of jolly mont which is the cricket australia headquarters and it's been an absolute party in between those two things was just a change of leadership, which changed the thinking, which changed the action, which changed the focus, where our focus goes, energy flows. Australian cricket, whether they win the series, lose the series, is irrelevant now. What they've got to win is the heart share of the Australian cricket fan back again to win more market share. It's the same in your industry. It's the same in my industry. It's the same in everyone listening to this podcast industry. Don't go out there and try and win market share. Go out there and win heart share. If you win heart share, market share follows. So Cricket Australia is just going through that cultural shift because... It's changed its leadership and leadership has brought a new dynamic, a new focus, but around an old fundamental, which is none of us are as good as all of us. So we all need to get a little bit better here. And Chris had just basically graduated from his law degree in in February of 2018. By the end of 2018, he started at Cricket Australia in a a commercial operations role. By the end of that year, Jesse, after being with the organisation for under six months, is the executive assistant to the highest ranking official of that particular organisation because that leader wants to reward thinking, actions and behaviours that are aligned with what he wants to see the wider group do. And again, I think that's an incredibly important lesson on lots of levels as well. And coming back to, just to circle back to our conversation around connection, what I really appreciate is you know, 1,100 emails and one handwritten note. Ladies and gents, for those of us who run a practice, just think about that for a moment. When was the last handwritten note that we wrote to a patient? We were all about expediency of communication. But really that connection comes from taking the time, having the thought, putting that... It's not even a huge amount of effort, just having the presence of mind to connect properly, fully and deeply rather than transactionally. And I think you know that lesson from your son speaks to lots of different things rick and kudos to chris if you're listening mate well done and uh, if you're not listening well well done to you anyway (laughs) and i think the other thing there jesse is no one ever frames a a lovely email but i've been into offices where they've got a framed thank you note or a framed thank you card from uh, someone who works with them or someone who's a client of theirs and and they keep it 
People get emotionally moved by someone who's taking the time to grab a pen, for goodness sake, and grab some stationery and written a nice card. My, you know, my, I'm where I am right now in my career because of the two most powerful words in the English language, which is thank you. But I've, I can express them. I can flick them off in an SMS or I can flick them off in an email. That's very expedient but it's probably not going to be very experimental to the heart of the person on the other end. But when they get a thank you note, a funny thing happens. They just kind of, they, 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 I think you start the hundred meter race. If you're trying to connect with them from about the 50 meter mark, if I'm brutally honest with you. So yeah, that's one of the real lessons there. I hope. Yeah, totally. Rick, you have been incredibly generous, not just with your time today, but with your knowledge, your insights, and of course, your wisdom as well. As we wrap up, I wanted to ask you one last question, and it's a fairly broad question, and there's going to be no right answer, of course. But for the audience listening, if there was one or two little things, if you could have, we've spoken about God today, so let's (laughs) let's talk about the gospel according to Rick while we're in there. If we were to talk about the gospel according to Rick and there was two or three key messages that you would like people to learn, perhaps they're things you've learned over the years or perhaps they're things you might have wished you'd learned earlier, whatever that may be, what would be one or two or three things that you would leave the audience with to help them have a, a wonderfully good 2019? Oh, mate, I mean, I could drill it down to two or three fairly comfortably because they're the things I really focus on every day. The first thing is energy, Jesse. If you don't have energy, you've got nothing. So people don't engage with the dental practice. They engage with the energy or the vibe of that practice. And that's spoken about in terms of how it's, you know, uh, marketed. We've got to be better marketers of what we do than doers of it because you can be the best in the world of what you do. But if you know it and your team know it, but none of your consumers know it, well, guess what? It ain't going to happen. So what I know about that is, Energy, marketing, they're linked. Who you are shows up well in advance of what you're going to do for the person. So energy is everything. You've got to be in control of that. For me, I wake up with a, with an attitude of gratitude. It sounds corny, I know, but uh, I'm figuring I've been to enough funerals this last year to know that this is a fleeting thing we've got, this opportunity. So we can stumble our way through it and look at all the negatives or we can really be perp- – living life on purpose is a, is a great way of doing it. So for me per- personally, I just kind of go energy is everything. That's the first thing. So rock up with a lot of energy. Now, if you need double espresso to do that, go do that. You know, whatever you need to do it, just make it happen. You know, for me, if I hear songs and music, and I, I, but I also, before I, before I go to sleep, the last thing I do before I go to sleep, I look at what's coming up the next day. This has been a, something that's been in my agenda to do now for, I think we booked this about six weeks ago, maybe. But I've been looking at it very intently this last sort of few hours before I went to sleep last night. And then it gives me the wake up with expectations. It's going to be a great day. So energy is everything. The, the other thing I know is the second message I would say is you and I both got 168 hours in the week. The beggar and the billionaire both have 168 hours in the week. In fact, We've got 86,400 seconds in the day. So my view would be don't waste any one of those because we think we've got an infinite amount of time to get things done. But some stage I'm going to be tapped on the shoulder. You're going to be tapped on it. We're all, I mean, you know, we can't take life too seriously because we're not getting out of it alive anyway, right? So the reality is we don't get to call when that is. We just get to call how we live while we're here. So wake up with the energy have a focus around, I cannot waste it. When someone says to me, look, do you want to go grab a coffee and kill an hour? I go, why would you do Like, why would you do that? Let's go grab a coffee and exchange something. Let's go grab a coffee and get better, but let's not waste an hour. You can't waste any of those two things, either one of the 86,400 seconds today. When someone gets cut off in traffic, if you're listening to this podcast, you go, man, I'm having a bad day because I got cut off. In tra- no, you had a bad second. Don't let it affect the other 86,399 seconds left in your day. Maybe they're in a hurry. Who cares? It's not going to affect your day. I don't let the outside world affect my inside headspace because if I do that, nothing I touch is going to turn to gold. So we've got to be aware of what that looks like. The third and last thing around that is gratitude. If you've got gratitude, you've got wealth beyond measure. If you have no gratitude, no money is going to make that happen. I like the things money can buy, Jesse, but I love the things that money can't buy. So money will buy you a house, but it won't buy you a home. You'll find a way to sabotage that. If inherently who you are, you don't believe you deserve that. Uh, We see it in relationships. Money might buy, well, the old saying from the Beatles was money can't buy you love. My wife says they just don't know where to shop. Right? She's <laughs> up for the Visa Card Hall of Fame. But my view is money doesn't buy you love. What money buys you is cho- choices and opportunities to create moments And I see my job role as a husband, I see my job role as a parent to create memories for life. And economically, 
I'm helped by that because of the, the money, but it's not, it's not the love of it. It's the ability to use it as a way of creating those sort of magic moments. So they're the three things I think. Energy, wake up with it, have an attitude of gratitude for goodness sake, and don't waste any one of your hours or, or seconds in the day because we don't have an infinite amount of time. It's very finite. And at some stage, you'll, you'll, you'll find out you've got less time than you thought. And that would be a bad place to get to and go, man, I wish I had done these. Make sure you're actually already doing those things. Again, it wraps up with what we talked about earlier. If Hollywood was, was to make your life a movie at the end of 2019, First of all, who would play you? I'm sort of seeing a bit of Kevin Costner meets sort of Tom Cruise kind of with glasses for you, buddy. Like, would you go and see? And if the answer is no, rewrite the script now. I'm thinking think we'll- Danny DeVito for me, mate. Yeah, I don't know. I reckon that's a bit he, harsh, mate. That is, he's quite, I'm like you, mate. I'm short. Yeah, I, I always say to my brother, who's 6'3", and my height across his shoulders, I say, if I want to eyeball you, mate, I've got to stand on my wallet. Anyway, that's a story for another time. It's probably because it's full of receipts. But my message would be that uh, everyone listening now, You've got all you need within you right now to have a great 2019. Information is three clicks away on the internet, but what's going to shift the needle? What's going to really make it happen? You don't know why you're doing what you're doing. I'm very grateful for the opportunities I have, so I know why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm going to go to everything with as much energy as I can bring to the table. And some might say, mate, try decaf. Well, that's okay. I'm, I, if you, you're telling me that, you're saying to me at least I'm shining a light, and if it's too bright, I'll dim it back. But it's much easier to dim it back Jesse than it is to brighten it up so my view is going to be I'll go with energy I'll go with attitude of gratitude and I'll go and see what I can give to this as opposed to what I can get from it and if I can do that then you know I'm ticking all of my internal boxes and therefore it doesn't really matter what outside voices who I don't really rate or value say about me or or all those sorts of things. But what does my wife think? What do my kids think? What do my business partners think? What do my key people in my life think? I'm going to listen to them. And certainly you're someone who I, I'm very keen to connect with more and more throughout 2019 because we clearly have a similar mission in life. Mate, I, I really look forward to that. And Rick, you, all of those three things you just mentioned there, you display in abundance. And I really, really thank you for being the person that you are, the work that you do and taking the time to come and hang with us and share some of that wisdom, that insight, and you're incredibly generous in all that you do. Ladies and gents, we've been talking to Rick Rushton, and you can find him at rickrushton.com, and I really, really, really would love you to go and get a copy of the book, The Power of Connection, and check out Rick's resources because there's so much gold there, there's so much wisdom, and I know, I absolutely know, that it's going to help you make 2019 a terrific year for you too. So I'd really encourage you to do that. Rick, thank you so much for hanging out with us, mate. It's been a pleasure and a treat and let's hang out again soon. Look forward to it, mate. And again, to everybody listening, have an outstanding 2019 and here's to your continued success. Thanks, mate. Thank you for listening to the Savvy Dentist Podcast with Dr. Jesse Green. For more free tools and resources, join the free Facebook group. Visit drjessegreen.com slash Facebook. And for more episodes, visit drjessegreen.com slash Savvy Dentist.